Thanks, David. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Now, how many people really did stay up, like, well past midnight? Did you guys do that? Or not, at least to midnight. Well, it's okay. Anybody stay up all through the night? I know there's one, so. Um, but he's here. I'm proud of him, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there were a few that went to bed at 4.30, 8.30. That's all right. Uh, I'm just glad that I can stand up here and be proud of our Big Ten teams. Like, right? Yeah. We did all right. I knew, everybody knew that I was going to say something about it. I was just hoping that it would be a little bit more positive. But anyway. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. What a great way to start off a year is to be in church together, uh, to worship the Lord together. Um, I don't know what it is. There is something about New Year's, and I'm sure a lot of you feel this way, that it's this time of transition, right? It's this, for whatever reason... The new year brings this sense of hope that things are going to be different. Things can change. There's something about just flipping that calendar page that I don't know why, that it's something in our minds thinks like, all right, I can do things different this year. I mean, we could do that any day that we flip a calendar page or rip off that one day of the week on, on those types of calendars or whatever. That could happen anytime, but for some reason, a new year, it's like, all right, I'm going to do it. Now, I don't know if you're like me. I make New Year's resolutions every year, and let's see, by 9.30 today, I'd already broken one of them because I was later here than I anticipated. That was, I was supposed to get here by 9.30, and I got here at 9.32, so, uh, so it, that's okay, right? Uh, I, I was reading some stats that um, around 16% of Americans only keep some of the resolutions, 13% of Americans, so like one in eight keep none of their resolutions, uh, and 80% of the resolutions we make across the board are going to fail. Um, but that, at least 20% of them kind of happen. So change is a good thing. Transition is not a bad thing. Um, but that's what I want to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Joshua chapter 1. You know, we are, we are still taking a little bit of a break from our Roman series. Um, and I thought since we're in the middle of this break, I'm going to take some time to Teach out of Joshua. As the other elders know, I've kind of been pushing to do a little bit of an Old Testament book and something out of Joshua for a long time. Um, it's, I don't know, I like these historical narratives. They're, they're action-packed. They're exciting. It, it's like seeing a really good movie, um, but better. Because, you know, this is something that really happened, that God was involved in this. Um, but Joshua chapter 1 is one of those times of transitions as well. You have the transition from Moses' leadership of the nation of Israel to Joshua's leadership. You have the transition from them wandering the 40 years in the wilderness to, to moving in and conquering uh, the, the promised land. Um, and so it seems like it's a real fitting book. And Joshua chapter 1 is, is a real fitting chapter to talk about a transition in our new year. So, um, so what I thought I would do is give us just a few simple ABCs about how we, just like they were conquering the promised land, how we can conquer the new year. Now, what I'm going to say, there's nothing new in what you're going to hear here, what you're going to hear today. Um, these should be things that if you've interacted with anybody in the church over a period of time would be things that are pretty basic um, in terms of how we live out our Christian life. But I think there are some principles that we'll hear just in this charge to Joshua um, that really are, are fitting for any new day as we live the Christian life. So 
If you have your Bibles there, I want you to take a moment and pray with me as we get started. Father, we come to you today, and just even as we sang, we want to turn our eyes to you, and we want to do it each and every day. We want to live our lives in such a way that is honoring to you. And as, as we have flipped that page on the calendar, as we think about this new year, God, we want to be fully committed to you. Um, and so certainly there are some principles that your word has for us um, that maybe we need to be reminded of. Certainly I, I know I do. And so God, help us to live in the power of your Holy Spirit um, to be faithful to you in all things. So teach us, make us more like your son. Um, yeah. So we thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles there open, uh, can you follow along with me as I read uh, Joshua chapter 1? And then I'm just going to stop every couple of verses or so and uh, uh, give a few thoughts uh, uh, on what we have to say. So there we go. Thank you. All right. So Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I always thought that this was an odd way to start off uh, any command that God's saying to people. It's like, Moses is dead. Let's move on. Now, it's not that he, God is being short or in, uh, disrespectful or insincere with anything. I, the nation of Israel had just finished 30 days of grieving uh, the death of Moses. Um, and after that appropriate time, um, God's saying to Joshua here, the time of weeping and mourning is over and it's time to get to work. Um, and so the first principle for conquering the new year, as I have it here for our ABCs, is that we need to align ourselves with God's plan. God's plan for Joshua is pretty clear on this. He says, get yourself and the people ready to cross over the Jordan River and go into the promised land. I mean, it's pretty direct. But Joshua could have said, yeah, I'm not really quite aligned with that plan yet. He could have said, I'm not, I'm not done grieving. He could have said, I'm not ready for it. He could have come up with excuses the way that Moses did 40 years prior, where yeah, I don't have the skills. People aren't going to listen to me. I'm not sure about this. But instead, if you jump down to verse 10, and we'll get there in a few minutes, but it says, Joshua, so Joshua ordered the officers to go through the camp and tell the people to get ready. Like, this was the plan, and Joshua was quick to align himself to it. Now, we in the church don't often get to hear the direct word from God the way that uh, Joshua did here. Um, but nevertheless, God has a plan for us. As we read throughout the New Testament, it's pretty clear what God's plan is for us. Now, we often talk about it here. We have the, the great commission and the great commandment to, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love others as well. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to disciple others and train them. We are to be salt and light in our world and in our community. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are here to represent Jesus. That's a pretty great plan. Yet too many of us within the church are busy doing our own thing. 
We often focus on a mission of our own design. We have a tendency to focus on our own comforts or focus on our own ambitions, focus on prospering for ourselves and not really lifting up the Lord. Like We within the church sometimes can be guilty of just living a life for ourselves rather than living a life that God has called us to. And rather than laying up treasures in heaven, we try to accumulate treasures for ourselves here on earth. But then we realize that it's going to pass away. Roth and mo- rust and moth are going to destroy uh, those treasures we lay up for ourselves. Well, about 25, 30 years or so ago, there was a... Uh, uh, a, Bible, a common Bible study uh, series that people were going through called Experiencing God. Uh, and have you gone through that, Henry Blackaby? It's a great study. One of the things that he says in that is, you cannot stay where you are and go with God. You cannot continue doing things your way and accomplish God's purposes and his ways. Your thinking cannot cl- come close to God's thoughts. For you to do the will of God, you must adjust your life to him or align your life to him. We must adjust your life to him, his purposes, and his ways. So just like Joshua here, his job was to align himself to what God was calling him to do. If we're going to conquer the new year, the first thing that we need to do is align our lives to God's plan. So let's continue reading here in in verse 3. He says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river to the Euphrates, or from the great river of the Euphrates and all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. So the second letter, the B here, is to believe God's promises. I think in your notes I might have accidentally put in a a word in, but you can cross that word out. I don't want you to believe in God's promises. I think we should believe God's promises. And and there's a subtle difference in that. Sometimes we believe in God's promises, or just that's our acknowledgement, yeah, that they exist. God's promises are there. But when we say that we believe God's promises, there's an implication there that we're going to act upon them. We're going to trust them, that those are real and they're going to happen. And because I know that they're real and true and they're going to happen, that I can act upon them. For Joshua, again, God's promises were pretty clear. God said, I'm going to give this land to the people. I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot. Here, what the boundaries are in the north all the way down to the south, what the boundaries are from east to west. And there's going to be nobody who's going to be able to stand up against you. Joshua needed to believe that these promises were real, that they were true, and that God could somehow accomplish what he said he was going to do. In other words, it took faith. And we'll get into this in a minute as well, but clearly this plan and these promises had some risk involved. Otherwise, why would God say a little bit later on, and he says this more than once, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. God's promises here didn't mean that he was just going to wave his hand and all the opposition and trials and hardships were all going to go away. I mean, he could have done that. He could have just said, go into the land, and guess what? It's completely empty. You don't have a battle to fight at all. You're going to come into the land, and everybody else is going to leave. You know, 
you're going to get this land and, and everything is going to be perfect. I mean, in some ways, we are kind of that way. We expect it to be that way. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm living this Christian life. I expect my life should be better or perfect. or shouldn't have any hardships. But that's not what the Bible promises. Those aren't the promises that we are called to believe because that's, it's not a promise that we're going to have, you know, I don't know. I think of that song way back in the, what is it, 60s or 70s of, you know, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. You know, God didn't say that to us. But God has made us promises. In Matthew, he says, come to me all you are burdened and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's a promise. 2 Corinthians, he says that my grace is sufficient in your weakness. In Romans, I can't wait till we get to this uh, a little bit later, but you know, and this is a verse a lot of us know. But, but he says that all things work together for the good for those who love him. And James, as we studied about a year ago, that the testing of our faith produces perseverance in Philippians he says that he will supply all of our needs again in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount we're told to seek first the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven and all of our other needs would be given to us as well And I know a lot of us know this verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It's, he will make our path straight if we acknowledge him. Like, now, it doesn't mean that there are no bumps on that path, but it's going to be a Straight path. It doesn't mean he's not going to turn us on occasion to go in a different direction. But there are promises that God has given to us, and we need to believe him. We need to live our lives according to those promises. Turn to him in the midst of our weakness. Turn to him in the midst of our trials. Look for the good in the midst of unfair or tragic situations. Trust that he will provide don't feel like we need to be the ones that help God out. And I know there are a few of us who, who like to take that type of proactiveness, shall we call it, to help God out. We need to trust God to believe God's promises and take him at his word. So that's the B. To conquer the new year, we need to align with God's plan, and we need to believe God's promises. Moving on, there in verse 5, continuing there, it says, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give it to them. The C in this is... Having confidence in God's presence. This is my favorite one. Well, you may recall me saying this in the past, but one of the things that drew me to Christ was this promise that he would never leave me or forsake me. You know, we live in a world that is constantly changing. There's no guarantee that the people who are in your life today will still be there tomorrow. Whether through a move or some tragic loss or just some breaking of a relationship. And certainly this was true in Joshua's time here. He was used to having Moses with him. You know, those 40 years where they were together in the desert, Moses was there. I mean, think about the, the loss that he was suffering as, as 
is describe how Deuteronomy describes Moses here at the end of the, the book. It says, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all the officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. I think if you had a friend like that, a leader like that, you'd kind of miss that, right? But God gave Moses this promise that he would never leave him. You know, this was a promise that was first given to Israel and Joshua before they entered the promised land back in Deuteronomy 31.6, which if I recall that the very first sermon I ever preached many years ago was out of that passage, Deuteronomy 31.6. As Joshua was about to take over the reins of leading the Israelites, Moses reminded him that the Lord himself goes before him, that the Lord would be with them. He will never leave you or forsake you. And Moses said, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Certainly he was about to take on a task that would bring fear and discouragement. He was going to go enter into this land that was full of people who did not know God, who were antagonistic and hostile toward God and his people, who really didn't want to give up their land. He was leading a whole bunch of people who weren't really good at following And God said, don't worry about it. I got your back. Not really, not, not just your back. I got you. I'm always going to be with you. It had to be an encouragement to know that God was going to be with them. And we all know that comfort of having somebody with us when we're about to do something that's a bit scary, right? My daughter, my little daughter, is one of those who she will barely go upstairs to go brush her teeth unless somebody goes upstairs with her. Even myself, you can ask my wife, I don't like making a phone call unless my wife is in the room with me. I don't know, there's something about the phone that I just do not like. So I like having somebody with me when I'm about to make a phone call. (laughs) might need to know that if I ever call you, that she's probably there in the room next to me. But But there is something comforting, right, of having somebody with us. And when that somebody is the God of the universe who made you, who created you for a purpose, who has a plan for you, has given you promises, there is a comfort and a confidence that comes with that. In the New Testament, the author of Hebrews reiterates this promise that God's presence is going to be with believers. In Hebrews 13.5, he says that. That he will never leave us or forsake us. But then the promise is preceded by a command that we should keep our lives free from the love of money and to be content with what we have. And I think the point there is saying instead of trusting in money or material wealth that we often tend to put our focus in, you know, those things will go away that will be spent, that will be probably spent on putting gas in your tank. Those things will go away. But we, instead of putting our hope in in money and wealth, should place our hope in God through promises that he will never leave us. He will never abandon us. Things of this earth can be gone in a moment. But God is with his children forever. And our faith and our trust should be in him alone. The reality is he will never leave us Because at the moment that we put our faith in Christ, we Christians are permanently, forever indwelled with the Holy Spirit. God himself indwells us. 
Jesus affirms this in John chapter 14 when he says that he was going to give the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would always be with his followers. Then in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, Jesus told his disciples that he would be with them to the very end of the age. A promise that wasn't just for his disciples, but that's for us as well, as we go into all the world. The God who promised to never leave Joshua is the same God who says he will never leave believers today. And this should bring us comfort. And just as it was intended for Joshua, this should also bring us courage. We don't need to live in fear. We don't need to worry about what tomorrow brings. The author of Hebrews, there in Hebrews 13, goes on to say that we can live, we can confidently say that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Again, something for us to look forward to when we get to Romans chapter 8. Chapter 8 of Romans says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we can have confidence in God's presence. That he will always be with us throughout this new year. So let's continue in verse 7. He says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything within it. All right. Letter D is to distar- discharge God's principles. All right, I admit this one is a bit stretched alphabetically here. I needed a D in here, so. Discharge, really the idea here is obedience. But I couldn't go A, B, C, O, so we're going to go A, B, C, D. All right. What it talks about here in these, these couple of verses is obeying what God tells him to do. God tells Joshua to obey his laws. Be careful to do what it says. Do not deviate from it. Do not compromise. Have God's word on your lips. Let this be what we talk about. It's real easy for us to talk about, you know, football and hockey and everything else. I mean, it's natural. We need to talk about life things too. But how often are we talking about the things of God? And how careful are we to obey it? And I find it interesting that he says to be careful to do what it says. It's to be mindful of it. It's not just, uh, this is just my lifestyle, so I do this thing. It's being intentional to follow the Lord, to be thinking about this. When, when choices come up, we do it. May, hopefully, we would be doing things because that is just a natural thing that we'd want to do. But to be careful and to be intentional about it is like, I want to do this to honor the Lord. I want to do this because... Not just because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. And it brings him glory. It's the same for us today. You know, again, on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about the wise man and the foolish man. You know, the wise man who built his house upon that rock. 
She says, that's the person who hears the word of the Lord and does them, who puts them into practice. Like if we want to conquer this new year, it'd do us well to do what God says. To be faithful in, in obeying him and not just doing our own thing. So let's, there's so much more I can say in that, but let me just continue on for the sake of time here. Continuing in verse 8 and verse 9. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So he reiterates what he's already said. To do that, but I think the letter here, the E in this that I want to draw out is that to conquer the new year means experiencing God's power. God promised Joshua if he did what he was told to do, then he would be successful, he would prosper. Ultimately, God would bring about the success that he promised. God would help him prosper in the promised land. Now, there's a little bit of a linear in this, but I do want to be careful in here because I don't think that this is saying that this is a, a, some spiritual formula, some linear equation that says that if you do A, B, C, and D, then you will get E. As if that there's some kind of health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. So I, I do want to be careful in that. I don't want you to hear me say that. God's power here doesn't necessarily mean that everything will go our way. Go the way that we expect it. Sometimes we can do everything we think God wants us to do and things will still seem to go south. Plans abruptly change. Tragedies occur. Things don't turn out as expected. But what I am saying is that when we are living a life according to his will, we can anticipate, we can look for, and we can see that he is at work in all that we're doing. We'll actually be able to see God's work in play. At the very beginning of this chapter, God told Joshua to be ready to cross over the Jordan River and that he was going to give him the land. He didn't exactly say how he was going to make that happen. He didn't exactly say when it was going to happen. But the things that seem impossible, you know, I'm a little bit of a spoiler look if you haven't read Joshua in a while. But those impossible things like defeating a walled, fortified city called Jericho, that was going to happen. Or things that were scary like, another spoiler alert, crossing a river without a bridge or going against all the kings on the west side of the Jordan, and it's repeated a number of times, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Whew. All those things that seem impossible or scary to go forward and do can be accomplished when God exercises his power to keep his promises. It's God the one who's doing it. As Hudson Taylor uh, and you've heard me talk about him before, a missionary to China in the 1800s, he put it this way, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's uh, supplies. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. If God said it, his power will accomplish it. And so for us, True prosperity means recognizing and enjoying the blessings that God gives us. True success 
means becoming the person God wants us to be in the place that God wants us to be and doing the things that God wants us to do. Our greatest success is to, f- is to fulfill through the power of the Holy Spirit all the purposes that God intends for us. It's his power at work in us to accomplish his will for our lives. All right, so let's move on to the last one. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go into... To, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Now, for those of you like me who like to try and fill in the blanks ahead of time, you probably already figured this one out. But the F here is fellowship with God's people. It says, go through the camp and tell the people. Tell them to get ready. Just like it's set up there in verse 2. You and all these people. Joshua wasn't asked to do this job alone. Yeah, he was the leader. But he was going to do it in conjunction, alongside with the entire nation behind it, with him. He wasn't a superhero who was going to come in and do it alone to save the day. Joshua, Joshua needed the whole of Israel to accomplish this task. And that's true for us as a church today. We are not lone rangers. We are not designed to live this Christian life alone, isolated from the rest. We are made to be a part of a body, to be in fellowship with one another, to do what God called us to do with other people, doing it with us, alongside of us, helping us, holding up our arms. Our Christian life is meant to be done in fellowship with other believers, in fellowship with God's people. The worst thing that we can do, well, I don't know, but it's probably not, maybe not the worst thing. I don't want to use superlatives, but it's a really bad thing for us to do to think that I don't need the church. I can show up on a Sunday and be okay and live the rest of my life, the rest of my week, without my brothers and sisters. That's not how we are designed to be. We cannot say to other members of the body, I don't need you. Or, you don't need me. We need each other. The reality is, you have something that I need. And I have something that you need. And you all have something that the rest of you need together. We all have our blind spots. We all have our weaknesses. But that's why we are meant to live this Christian life together. And so those are the ABCs of this section. The ABCs of conquering the new year. But if I wanted to add one to it, and as we go into a time of communion together, that... Really, there's, there's another thing, and it's, it's not going to be in your notes. Um, but there is a, a part of going into this new year that we need, and if we're going to be successful in our faith, living out this Christian life, is that we need to remember if I were to continue with the theme of the ABCs, I might call this letter G of just of gratitude. Taking communion together gives us space to, be, to remember and to be thankful for what God has already done for us. 
I don't know if you do this, but it's not a bad thing for you to do, but you know, at the end of the year, to think back and, and write down or to speak out loud and remember the ways that God has blessed you over the last year. Even if some of that blessing feels painful. To go back and think about what has happened and what has God brought you through. It's a good thing to take time to remember and to be thankful and to have gratitude. And so we're going to take time, and that's what communion is, is taking time to give thanks that the Father has provided a Savior to us. That the Father has given us a Savior that forgives us of our sins and has restored our relationship with him. So David, if you want to come on up and play a little bit, we're going to transition into this time of communion. You've heard us say this in the, the past, that when we approach the Lord's table, we do this as witnesses. That we testify that all barriers between God and humanity have been removed by the death of Jesus once and for all. And in the Lord's Supper, we share this food, not to be made right with God, but as a celebration of being in a covenant relationship with him. We don't come in as strangers. We don't come in as people who don't have hope. We're not without God in this world. We're no longer far off from him. But we are in fellowship with him. So in communion, we look forward to the great hope that we have and that we will share together one day in heaven. Now, at EBC, we celebrate open communion. You don't need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a Baptist. You don't need to do all the things that you might think that a Christian's expected to do. But if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, we invite you to take communion with us. And if you're sitting out there today and you're saying, I'm not sure, I don't know if I've ever trusted Christ for my sins. Or I'm not sure what you're talking about when it talks about this relationship with God. I would encourage you to, to not take communion, but use this time to talk with the Lord, to sit there quietly and pray, or, or maybe to ask your neighbor to explain a little bit more what this might mean. I'm sure if you tapped your neighbor on the shoulder and asked for them to pray with you, they'd be happy to walk you through what we're talking about here. So. So as was mentioned before, we have our elements on the side and on the back. On the back are the gluten-free ones. Um, so I'm going to dismiss you just to go in, 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 in reverence and in silence, to go back and take a bit of bread and take some juice and then come back to your seat. And we'll take the elements together in just a moment. <laughs> 